Hello, I'm Mike McClure. And I'm Sharon Bennett, coming to you from the South Service Center. In this edition of NTV, we'll hear about a back-saving device being tested by our crews, a new partnership in Fremont, updates on the renovation at the North and South Service Centers, and more. But first, some recent news about City Light. In the last issue of NTV, we mentioned City Light's proposed rate increase of 6.5%. Following public hearings, the City Council instead approved an increase that will average 5.7% for this year. With the 8.9% surcharge coming off at the same time, this year's rate change will be a slight decrease, averaging 2.9%. The Council also approved a 5.3% increase for 1996. The new rates will go into effect on March 1st of each year. Seattle City Light has the distinction of being the only Northwest utility and one of only 12 utilities nationwide to sign a voluntary accord to reduce global warming. In January, at the U.S. Department of Energy in Washington, D.C., Deputy Superintendent Barbara Harvey Brayton represented Seattle City Light at the official signing ceremony with U.S. Energy Secretary Hazel O'Leary. The Global Climate Challenge is a joint, voluntary effort of the U.S. Department of Energy and the electric utility industry to reduce greenhouse gas emissions back to 1990 levels by the year 2000. On the local level, City Light has embarked on a challenge of another kind. Right, Mike. It's called the Neighborhood Power Project, and it's all about conservation and cooperation. In hopes of improving the sense of community, the conservation ethic, and the know-how to carry out conservation ideas, the Neighborhood Power Project was recently launched in Fremont at the new Puget Consumers Co-op. Well, our EMSC department looked at the success of other community-based programs, Hood River, Oregon, Hood, Hood River Conservation Project, and the Espanola Power Savers Program, Espanola, Ontario, Canada. And we looked at the penetration in uh, rates of how successful they were in getting their customers to get involved in conservation programs. So we decided to test that concept, community-based conservation, in an urban environment. And instead of looking at a small town, focusing on small towns, we were going to focus on a neighborhood. So we chose the Fremont neighborhood because of its history of uh, neighborhood activism and also because the good mix of commercial, residential, and industrial sector right in the area. So very much the Fremont neighborhood mirrors a, a small town. And I think the bottom line here that we're trying to accomplish is instead of planning our programs for our customers, we're planning them with our customers. City Light planned this cooperative effort with a grant from the Department of Energy's Urban Consortium. Seven city departments, including City Light, Water, and Solid Waste, have teamed up with the State Energy Office and BPA for the project. But the key to success may lie in the active involvement of the neighborhood, the Fremont Neighborhood Council, Fremont Chamber of Commerce, and the Fremont Arts Council are all active supporters. So the Fremont Neighborhood Power Project is based on a partnership. It's a partnership of different city agencies working together, and it's this partnership of city agencies working with community groups in Fremont, partnering with the neighborhood. And the importance of that is the different is that all the city agencies are offering all their conservation programs under one umbrella program, and then the neighborhood is giving us advice on how best to bring that program to the neighborhood. So each agency has its own role. Solid Waste Utility is offering their conservation programs and also evaluation advice. Uh, the Water Department is offering their conservation programs. The Department of Neighborhood helps us with neighborhood selection uh, and also meeting community le leaders once we've selected a neighborhood. And the Washington State Energy Office as well is coordinating a series of workshops for us. Uh, we're really pleased to be able to host the kickoff event for the pilot power project. We're new in the neighborhood and we're looking at ways that we can fit in with the community and we just saw it as a great opportunity to introduce ourselves to the neighborhood and also help get the word out on a really good program. The year-long pilot project will start off this month by canvassing the neighborhood with conservation information and offering free workshops on conservation for the home, yard, and neighborhood. If the project is successful in Fremont, a second pilot will be conducted in a different neighborhood. Sharon, what's the first thing most people think about when you mention city light? Probably street lights. And of course, you can't have street lights without poles. Did you know that city light replaces more than a thousand poles every year? On any given day, 
Mike Gibbons and his crew may set one new pole or as many as four. Some poles are fairly simple to replace, such as the one we're seeing now. Others, however, could take an entire day and require the help of a line crew to move equipment out of the way. The ones that are harder are those uh, with uh, primary on them. Uh, specifically, uh, if you have more than one gain or a corner pole, where you have uh, maybe uh, well, 26 and 4 kV both, uh, then you have to clear wires out of your way, create a path for the pole to come up. <coughs> And uh, a lot of times you're bound as to where you can put the pole by the utilities underground or the street curb. You need to clear the curb by two foot at least. And uh, once again, you know, uh, underground utilities play a big, big role on that. And uh, once you figure out where it's going, then you got to move wires to get it to where it's going to end up. City Light service area has more than 94,000 poles and half of them are 30 years or older. The average life of a pole is 30 to 40 years, so it's not surprising that two crews from north and two crews from south are dedicated to the year-round task of setting poles. The most common reason for replacing poles is rot. Others are replaced because they've been damaged by cars, storms, or are part of a large conversion job. Another reminder of city light is underfoot, what people often refer to as manhole covers. They're really utility vault covers, and lifting them can be a real pain in the back. But an idea now being tested can be a real back saver for crews in the field. With safety being one of our corporate goals, the Safety Health and Wellness Unit, along with ergonomist Steve Davis, identified the manual lifting of utility vault covers as an area for improvement to reduce the risk of injury to City Light workers. The Executive Safety Council agreed, so Steve took on the challenge of developing a tool that could help. Once we realized, uh, went out and um, did some research in the field to figure out how much force and risk of injury there actually was to a field uh, worker operating and lifting the manhole covers, we realized that we needed to design a tool that would straddle the lid and have a vertical force, but would balance the lid both on heels and on flat surfaces um, and be operable for many different types of vault lids with different hole placements, solid, graded, whatever. So I presented this to my grandfather who is a, uh, uh, has a machine shop and we sat down on paper and designed a tool um, outside of City Light one day and, and fabricated in his shop and we worked together, uh, my grandfather Al Neely and I. The lightweight device can be operated by one person to remove utility vault covers that can weigh as much as 600 pounds. Without the device, it generally takes two people using hooks to remove a cover. Add on to that the increased force needed to lift the cover that's impacted in the roadway, and it can take as long as 20 minutes to remove one cover. For the past six months, Ed Meekham and his crew from the North Service Center have been testing the tool in the field. We find that uh, having a mechanical device that's lightweight, and we can use it any streets, sidewalks, alleys, and everything, gives us actually a mechanical advantage to lift the tool rather than having to use people power and have a chance of uh, risking a back injury. Back injuries are uh, fairly common in the network. These lids here weigh uh, between 300 and 500 pounds and there's a tendency in the pavement that the road debris and paving, that they're wedged in place and it's just like they're cemented in place and it takes a tremendous amount of force to break them loose and that's how we often get our back injuries. Ideally, all lids would have a standard design, but in the meantime, the device has interchangeable parts so it can be used on almost any lid. In response to the field test, the tool has been modified over the past year. Crews from the South Service Center will soon begin field testing the device. Once again, congratulations are in order for several City Light employees. Nine individual employees and four groups from City Light were recognized at the second annual Diversity Awards ceremony in January. Called a piece of the dream and sponsored by the Mayor's Office and the City Personnel Department, the uplifting event attracted a standing room only crowd. This year there were more than 60 nominees from throughout the city. The awards recognize individual employees or groups of employees who show leadership in promoting diversity in the workplace and the community. Adele Heward was one of two individual City Light employees who received plaques for their accomplishments. Oh, I think it's the reason why I, was, I received this award is because of the, uh, I include in my, my curriculum and my day-to-day -day work to 
to coordinate with the YMCA and they have these high risk kids that are they have no uh, high school uh, diploma they are on they're taking GED courses mm -hmm. so I coordinate with them and take them for two months and try to train them to know uh, how to do uh, what was that timesheets and accounting data entry uh, computer word processing and those are the uh, the entry level skill that we need to so they can work for city light or any other areas in the city or the other or other agencies in the government and luckily it works and it helps them a lot these kids are on welfare they have kids uh, you know a single mother and I think that I couldn't give them the money so maybe this will help them having a skill and they can be uh, self-sufficient congratulations to all of the winners Last month, we told you about downtown City Light employees moving into the AT&T Gateway Tower. Well, other employees are involved in plans for major renovations to the North and South Service Center. Within the next couple of years, work will begin on renovating both the North and South Service Centers, with completion of Phase 1 expected in 1997. While the projects are proceeding on parallel tracks, each location has its own employee committees involved in setting goals and identifying specific needs. To make sure the projects are coordinated, a representative from the North Service Center sits on the South Service Center's Oversight Committee and vice versa. Recently, the architects for each site presented their concepts to the Oversight Committee. Ashok Naidu represents the South Service Center on the North Service Center Oversight Committee and Dave Smith represents North on the South Oversight Committee. Okay, at this point we've had um, meets with the architects in the South Service Center and we've looked at two sets of plans that comply with the budget requirements and one that sort of exceeds the budget requirements. So it's going to come down to a question of can we obtain the excess of funding that we require to do what we really think we need to do at the South Service Center at this point in time. And at the North Service Center we're at much the same spot. Uh, the um, architectural team has come back and given us some some options um, they've just just now coming up with a third option that looks like it's going to be a, a, a good choice for us but again like the South Service Center uh, we're budget constrained on the on the uh, service center uh, uh, remodels and so we're trying to make the most of that budget and to see uh, what options we have for even expanding those budgets and that will have to go before the CIP review committee in terms of um, what funding or what choices the department's going to make when it comes to uh, what the CIPs it funds. If all goes as scheduled, construction should begin next February. Well, that's it for this time. For Network on Television, I'm Sharon Bennett. And I'm Mike McClure. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.